Hello you all, I'm Black Witch Yaya. Thank you so much for tuning into this video. I tried to come up with a nice cold open for this video, but honestly, I want to take this Lake Lanier situation layer by layer. So I want to start from the beginning. And by the beginning, I mean what Lake Lanier was before it was a lake. Lake Lanier is located in Forsyth County. Well, the actual shorelines covers about five counties, Dawson, Forsyth, Gwinnett, Hall, and Lumpkin. We all may be familiar with Lake Lanier from a few of the several hundred accidents that has taken place there. But before Lake Lanier was known to be one of the deadliest destinations in America, it was actually a town of thriving black people called Oscarville. So where this entire lake is now currently, it was actually a town before it got drowned out. During the reconstruction era in the 1800s, Oscarville was a prosperous black community with nearly 1,100 residents, most of whom were freed after fighting in the American Civil War. 58 of those residents were landowners and the occupations consisted of carpenters, blacksmiths, bricklayers, and farming was the top trade. Due to the fact that they had the best harvest while the rest of the state was struggling, they managed to make a decent living for themselves creating a healthy community with churches, schools, and businesses. So even though this town was very prosperous, black people were doing their thing, they still had to keep one eye open. They just had a heavy fear of violence that could take place in their community. And this fear enhanced, especially after the race riots that took place in 1906. And soon that fear would manifest through several incidents. So before we get into what happened, let's talk about what's going on now. Of course, this is a black community. These are freed blacks. They're actually working, making a living for themselves. And then they have to nerve to have the best crops in the state. So of course, who's going to get jealous? The white people because they weren't expecting them to be as successful so quickly. They thought, who are you? Why do I have to come to you for stuff? So of course, all this tension is going on. So there were several incidents that happened, like I said before, and I'm getting this straight off of news1.com because I do not want to miss a detail because this all leads to the drowning out of Oscar. So on September 5th, 1912, a 22-year-old white woman by the name of Ellen Grice claimed two black men tried to rape her. They were unsuccessful because they were scared away by her mother. The Forsyth County Sheriff arrested five black men in the alleged assault. News of the attack and arrest caused quite a stir in the surrounding black communities. A vocal pastor in the area by the name of Grant Smith appealed to the sheriff to release the men. He claimed there wasn't much evidence to hold all five men accountable for the assault assault and he also suggested that one of the men could have already been in a consensual relationship with Grice. Of course many whites were outraged by Smith allegations and an angry mob beat and horse whipped the preacher on the steps of the courthouse nearly taking his life. So that was the first incident and just one week later on September 12th 1912 an 18 year old white woman named Mae Crow was raped and beaten in the Big Creek community of Forsyth County, Georgia. The next morning, Crow's body was found half naked, bloody, and hidden under a pile of leaves. Her skull had been bulged with stone, but she was alive and barely breathing. Searchers would allegedly find a small pocket mirror at the scene of the crime that was said to belong to Ernest Knox, a 16 year old black boy from Cumming, Georgia. Knox was arrested at his home, then subjected to a mock lynching, which led to his forced confession for the attack on Crow. And we know during this time, it seems that anytime a white person got hurt, especially white women, the only thing they decided to do was point the finger at the closest black person, I'll almost say something else, at the closest black person that they could find just to put the blame on someone else and just consider them like, oh, just put the blame on them. Someone needed to be held accountable for it instead of actually doing an intense investigation to figure out what happened. As word spread on the attack on Crow, and the confession by Knox, whites became increasingly angry. It wasn't long before a lynch mob formed in front of the jailhouse where Knox was being detained. Officers had to sneak Knox out of the back door so he wouldn't come face to face with the mob who were attempting to hang him. He was taken into jail in Atlanta for his protection, but was soon stand trial for the attack. The next day, four additional men Oscar Daniel, Rob Edwards, Jane Daniel, and Ed Collin were arrested and taken into custody suspected to be accomplices to the 16 year old. Of course, all of them were black. Soon, another angry mob of more than 2,000 racist white people had stormed the county jail gaining access to the cells. They shot and killed Rob Edwards, dragged his body from the jailhouse, and hung him outside on a telephone pole. 
Ernest Knox and Oscar Daniel were both found guilty of the rape of May Crow. They were sentenced to death by hanging, even though it was illegal by state law at the time. 8,000 racist whites in the town congregated around Town Square of coming to watch two teenage boys get publicly hanged for an alleged crime they never truly had the opportunity to fight. It was after this hanging that the terror would begin to spread as a white group of terrorists known as the Night Riders would make it their mission to run every black person they came across out of town, out of their own town, Oscarville. Oscarville, of course, became one of the main targets and over the short period of just a few years, 98% of its black residents would end up either leaving their homes or being murdered for refusing to leave. Black property deeds found their ways mysteriously into the hands of white neighbors without any bill or safe or transfer. This effectively allowed many whites to steal the land once owned by their black counterparts when they were driven out by the Night Riders. Over 1,100 black residents would lose their livelihood and in a town once a flourishing African-American community would become a ghost town. So just from my perspective and all the history that I've learned in school, the movies I've watched, I honestly feel all of this was a setup. I feel that with these incidents happening back to back, either one, it was a white person who was doing it that was just on the loose and they just decided to blame a black person, or they finally got fed up and jealous of the flourishing black people in their town and wanted to take over. And the best way to do it was let's get mad because they hurt a white woman and let's drive them out. I don't know if they thought those two incidents would scare them away and they would naturally go. But just with those two incidents happening, the hangings, the mobs, and then all of a sudden their deeds are being put into the hands of white people. They're stealing their land. And honestly, with the farms, they didn't even know what to do with it. Because in 1915, a bull weevil infestation killed crops on Oscarville. That was basically due to the fact that them white farmers they didn't know what the hell they were doing. So they started ruining the crops. Though they ultimately survived the weasel infestation being one of the few regions in the state to escape total dissemination made them eager to share their methods which basically they were just getting chicken poop to fertilize the ground but this eventually got the attention of the Atlanta mayor who was developing a dam to ensure the city's water supply hydroelectric needs and flood control he spent two years working with the army corps of engineers to seize nearly all of that recovered farmland so when this farmland was actually sold they gave the black people pennies on the dollar basically nothing for their land and it left the 58 residents who was actually landowners nothing they could have passed down nothing to their generations over time pieces of the land would be sold to the government and by 1950 a plan to build Lake Lanier was in full effect Soon, the entire town of Oscarville would be underwater. Intentionally flooded in conjunction with the Buford Dam to support the growing demand for a water supply to the nearby cities. The reservoir would be named after Sidley Nanier, a poet and a musician, and also a Confederate private. In the end, construction would destroy more than 50 acres of farmland and displace more than 250 families. It would relocate 20 cemeteries and their corpse in what some may see as an attempt to erase the sins of its past. The lake was 692 miles of shoreline and is 26 miles long covering almost 47 miles of the original riverbed at the dam the lake is more than 200 feet deep and just to add emphasis on how deep this water is there are trees that are underneath this lake that stand over 60 feet tall lake lanier is considered full when it's at its peak of at 1071 feet above sea level the current lake level normally rises during the winter and early spring and falls during the hot summer months so after the black population was drove out of Oscarville, the community maintained a white-only policy far into the 1980s to convey a sense of how committed Forsyth County residents were to racial purity. In the 1950s and 60s, there were no colored drinking fountains. There were no whites-only restaurants. There were no inhabitants to segregate in the county and spaces were solely open to white residents. National civil rights activities organized the Brotherhood March in 1987, which drew a considerable number of people from outside the county. They were quickly overwhelmed by crowds of rock throwing rioters, yelling racial slurs. So now we know about Oscarville, what happened to Oscarville, of course, white people running amok. So this is where some of the eerie history comes into play. I want to pause right here. So we have a town that was filled with flourishing black people, black people making their own, being landowners, getting their footing in the world after being free. Then you have the white people being jealous, hatred, and just flat out racist, demonic creatures. Not I'm talking about these people that just destroyed their livelihood, stole and just killed them. So that just destroyed their livelihood, stole from them, killed them and just 
destroyed everything they had going on. So this is where the eerie history comes into play because when they flooded out this town, it was a lot of stuff left over. By stuff, I mean the actual community. They decided just to leave some houses up. They destroyed some houses, left the brick houses up. It seems like a rush job. They just tore down whatever they felt like tore down. The rest, they just left it. They thought, hey, it's going to be underwater. Who cares? But let me tell you who cares. Them 511 million unmarked graves of people who are still buried underneath the surface cares. So as I told you before, they removed the corpse in the tombstones of marked graves who knows where they put them? They said they relocated them. Sure, of course. Okay, I'll believe that. But what about the unmarked graves? What about the individuals that were left in their houses? What about the individuals that you killed and just left stranded there? They're all still underneath that water. Let's talk about the Orisha aspect. You guys know water, Yemaya, Oshun, just sticking to Yemaya in this case. We know that there are certain times of the year, and usually this is hurricane season. And in the Paraki, and a story is told that Yemaya start having flashbacks, getting re mad about how the slaves were brought across the water. There's also a part in there where she's mad at Shango because he didn't help. So there's a part within hurricane season where it shares that this is the time of year where Yemaya gets mad about the slave trade and she starts disrupting the waters and causing natural disasters so you have a town that was filled with black flourishing people then you cover with water messing with a water spirit that's there to protect black people and you wonder why people drown every five minutes because i feel that they're trying to collect the number of souls that was taken from them to make it even so what 1100 residents y'all got 700 people that drowned so far and i'm sure there's going to be much more to come i wonder if the number is going to stop at 1100 that would be creepy. Could you imagine if it stops at 1100 because it was 1100 re residents there? So they're trying to collect the souls back of what was once there. So stories about mysterious underwater sightings are eerie and they usually happen around Halloween. But the true backstory of Lake Lanier built over an underwater ghost town. Since the creation of Lake Lanier, there has been over 700 deaths since 1956 to 2023. The causes of death vary. You have boating accidents, drownings, and just mishaps. Those who have survived any type of close calls, they say they know how to swim. They've been swimming since they were a kid. They don't understand what happened. And usually if you're drowning, just stay calm. You'll float to the top. But they said when they're underwater, it feels like they're gently being pulled down. For some odd reason, when they try to swim back up to the top, they felt heavier than usual. And they just felt a limb like their arm or their leg being pulled back down. They had to fight their way back up to the top. It wasn't as natural as it comes when they're swimming in the pool or swimming in any other body of water. And there are several stories of people who share this. If they almost had a drowning accident, flipped off of those little ski things, whatever people do in water. Anytime they have to swim back up, it almost feels like someone is pulling them back down. It's not an easy float like it usually would be for an experienced swimmer. So, of course, my witchy self, I'm like, those must be the people who are still underneath there who were killed. And I'm sure, I'm sure they didn't even take the time to go through those houses to make sure all the residents were actually left or actually disposing of bodies that were killed. I'm sure they just left them there and was like, well, they're going to be underwater. So that's the spiritual aspect that I have on it. But many researchers have stated it could be due to the heavy debris at the bottom of the lake. That debris being Oscarville because it's still a whole community and tombstones down there. Just imagine a neighborhood there are still houses there are still streets there are still crosswalks and i'm sure you guys know it's considered disrespectful to damage anyone gravesite tombstone to pee on it to mark on it to paint it to take stuff away from it which we need to do a video on you should not be taking flowers away from a tombstone that don't belong to you i'm sure y'all know but there's a story behind it but it's considered disrespectful to do any type of damage or stealing from a tombstone so imagine the anger that's enraged by these spirits when they just didn't damage it they just decided to flood it out so with this flooded lake with all of this debris, which is a town, when someone does drown or go missing, they kind of find it a little too dangerous for divers to go in trying to find them because of how deep and dangerous the lake is. So a lot of times they're just like, we'll see if they float to the top. We'll see if they come a little bit higher, but it's more dangerous for us to go down there than for us just to sit and wait to see if they float up. But a lot of times the bodies don't float up because they're caught by trees. They literally may get stuck in a house that's underneath the... They literally may get stuck in the window that was a, of a house. And some divers who are brave enough to get even close to the floor of this lake say they have found limbs of dead people. So now let's get into the haunting aspect of Lake Lanier because there is a story behind it. And this story is called The Lady of the Lake. In April of 1958, Delia Mae Parker Young 
was reportedly traveling with Susie Roberts to the Three Gables, a local roadhouse in Donsville, Georgia. Susie was driving her 1954 Ford across the Lanier Bridge when for some unknown reason she lost control of the car crashing off the right side of the bridge. Divers entered the lake and searched the area but neither the vehicle nor any remains were discovered. The physical evidence of the occurrence was skid marks suggesting that the woman's car went into the lake. Then a year later in 1959, a fisherman discovered human remains that had floated to the surface of the lake. Further examination yield no obvious cause of death and the individual could not be positively identified, although the body was noted for missing both hands and several toes. Many assumed these were the remains of Delia or Susie, but at the time it was impossible to know for sure. And it was only found because in November 1990, they drained the lake a little bit because they were preparing to do pillars for the bridge. And unexpectedly, the shell of a rusted out car was discovered with human remains still inside behind the wheel. This lady was still behind the wheel. Searching through the personal belongings in the car, a purse, ring, and a watch, Susie Roberts was able to be identified. And in light of this discovery, it was concluded that the young woman found decades before was in fact Delilah Mae Parker Young. For three decades, Susie Roberts was trapped in her car, hidden under 90 plus feet of water, stuck within tree trunks, mud, and other debris that made up the bed of Lake Lanier, but now she could be properly laid to rest. It is this tragedy that has been the foundation of the most persistent legends associated with Lake Lanier. The soul of a young woman in a blue dress that has been reportedly seen time and time again walking up and down the length of Lanier Bridge. And according to those who have seen this spirit, who has become known as Lady of Lake Lanier? She is missing her hands. So the soul of this individual has been spotted several times by different individuals and they all describe her as wearing a blue dress and missing her hands. So as I'm looking through the dates, I see the lake was officially created in 1956. Those two young women died in 1958. For there to be a whole story behind them, Lady of the Lake, I wonder what makes, I'm not going to, I wonder what makes them so special. But I wonder what makes those energies so special where it's actually being seen by other individuals. I'm thinking was that the first person that was killed by the lake but they say the incident started in 1956 the first year that it was made i want to make the connection of what was about them that made them ghosts that haunted the land and make other people recognize them so much because when you ask separate people you can ask them in a separate room they're all going to describe the person as the same thing a lady in a blue dress walking up and down a Lanier bridge out by the water at night scaring fishermen scaring divers when people go underwater and they flood they're about to drown they see this individual they're all describing the same thing so i wonder what was it about her that actually made her stay on the premise and haunt the land i wonder what she related to one of the people who really did some damage but we're going to continue so the next ghost that is known to hunt lake lanier is a mysterious raft seen floating on the lake late at night its inhabitant a shadow figure pushing along with a pole a lantern lighting his way those who have made claims to have seen this nocturnal soul say it seems to appear and disappear out of nowhere one such sighting was reported by two fishermen who claimed to have seen it at about 1 a.m on a cold autumn night the raft was spotted in a section of the lake that is known to be roughly 45 feet deep, yet the raft's rider seemed to have no difficulty navigating the water with a pole to push him along. The two fishermen watched as the figure traveled along before suddenly shouted and jumping from the raft into the freezing water. Afraid something was coming for them, the two fishermen quickly pulled their lines and prepared to leave the area. But when they shined their lights across the water, there was no sign of the raft or the figure. The dark surface of the lake calm and undisturbed as if nothing ever happened those who believe this tale to be true believe the mysterious figure was in fact an echo of the past when men once traveled the shallow rivers and creeks among the foothills of northern georgia that have since been consumed by lake lanier so a lot of people think in these instances the residents of oscarville the black people want their community back those who refuse to leave still refuse to leave to this day so they're carry on just so they're carrying on with their business they would see ghosts of women shopping they will see ghosts of men farming of this one traveling across the water basically doing their daily operations but on the lake but to them their spirit is still in oscarville at the surface when it was visible to everyone else so every now and then individuals would catch these spirits and ghosts just carrying on with their day and as soon as they try to get clarity or get closer the spirit disappears 
So as I stated in my Myrtle Plantations video, we usually when these spirits linger around certain areas where they were killed or in this case, force, forcefully removed, they have unfinished business. Sometimes spirits are like, okay, you may have taken me away from this space in the physical sense, but my spirit still remains here. I still want to carry on and live here. So I feel like that's why a lot of the spirits are being seen. And then I also said like before, I feel like they are trying to claim those numbers back. So I believe at 1100, it may stop or they may try to double it or triple it. They say magical things happen in threes. Not wishing that on anyone. I wish no one else would pass in that lake. But just from my standpoint on usually how spiritual interactions and exchanges works, I'm like, it has to be evened out. And you guys know, naturally, you may hear the saying that oceans carry secrets at the bottom of the waters treasures they're all of the riches are at the bottoms of bodies of water that's why a lot of people throw money into water because it's them tapping into the riches and the wealth that could come from it and also when people meditate or they want to relax they usually listen to ocean waves or go out by the ocean it's usually relaxing because it's tapping into the inner you the secrets the what's below the surface literally so i feel with oscarville being at the bottom of this lake is holding secrets is holding a dark past and it's holding vengeance because where else in the world do you know a lake that's consistently taking bodies and people who consistently go now i said i would go to a haunted house lake lanier oh mm -mm, i don't even want to drive by it no i'm sorry i don't want to be nowhere near it i don't think i'm excluded i don't know what white man may be in my lineage that's connected to georgia because you know i'm geechee i don't know what i don't know what's mm -mm. No. And Lanier is like a last name in my family. No, mm -mm, I'm good. I'm good. To my cousin, I know she's watching this. I love you, but no, you shouldn't go either because you have that last name. So, But you guys let me know down below on the ocean floor. What do you guys think about Lake Lanier? What do you think all of these deaths are? Why do you think all of these deaths are occurring? What other secrets do you know about Lake Lanier? Have you ever been there and experienced anything? Have you seen one of the ghosts that we talked about? I will share the links to these stories that I shared down below. But let's continue this conversation. Let me let me see who which one of y'all crazy people done been to Lake Lanier. But thank you guys so much for tuning into this video. And like I always say, as above, so below, as within, so without, as universal, the soul. Until next time, you guys, I say baby.